Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simon, it's like diamonds. We've got Luke Simon's like diamonds. Pat Ogletree, looking good. They're in Texas right now. How are you guys? Doing good. Loving the weather. It's uh, it's it's great down here. If you haven't been to Texas, uh, I uh, I surely uh, strongly uh, think you should get down here. It's awesome. Love it. If you guys don't know, you know Pat is one of our full time fishing coaches and. He is actually living in an RV. So he and his wife are traveling around and fishing with some of our members. He just got done fishing with one of our, our members uh, today in, uh, in Texas and documenting the whole thing and really just proving that what we teach and some of the things that we'll cover today in these don'ts, these big 10 don'ts, mistakes, whatever you want to call them for somewhat newer anglers, just proving that all this stuff that we teach works regardless if you're in Texas Louisiana, where you recently were, or, you know, yeah. going all the way up to the Carolinas and Virginia, and then back down to Florida. So really, really cool. It's a, it's been neat to, to watch this journey and it's uh, going to continue all, all year long. So for you insider members, you get to see exactly where Pat's fishing every single week and uh, including all the great stuff, which is where he caught fish and where he missed fish and the pre-trip planning and the post-trip analysis. Really, really cool stuff. So this will be a good one. Uh, we started it off by talking about like do's and don'ts. We're like, man, let's just talk about the don'ts. Like that's the stuff that we all wish that someone had told us like, oh man, that would have saved me a lot of time. Um, and these are in no particular order, but th there, there are 10 of them and they're very, very important. And uh, I'm going to kick it off with the first one. And, and we're seeing this a lot because we have a lot of ads going with this 11 lures and Slam Shady's been around for years now. And, you know, I, I see it where someone will say, oh, man, I, I, I got my free pack of Slam Shady and I just haven't caught any fish. And, um, and, and they put that as the focus, right, that it's Slam Shady. Slam Shady is a great lure, but it's horrible if you're fishing in a dead zone. Like nothing is going to catch you fish in a dead zone. So the kind of mistake number one is. Don't put all the focus on the lure or the bait or whatever. Focus more on the fishing spot, right? For the, the 90 10 zone. We talk about over and over and over again in our club. Find that 90 10 zone then, and only then, you know, put the big focus on the lure, the line, or knots and that kind of stuff. So many people do it the opposite. And, and it's funny just reading some of the comments on, uh, on that. And people are like, well, hey, it, it's not the lure that catches fish. It's a, it's a fisherman armed with the right spot armed with the right lure and tackle that actually catches the fish so what do you what do you guys think is the is the first one that that's something but, that we all did right yeah it's the number one thing right it's i mean it's all goes down to whether it's business or relationships or whatever but what's the one thing that if you just do this one thing properly everything else is easier and it's not it's lure selection it's it's about finding the fish if you are good about finding the fish on knowing how fish react to different weather patterns or seasons or, or whatever the case is, even tidal flow movements. If you know that, you know where those fish are, you could have bad lures or, or terrible bait and still have a really good chance of catching them. Whereas the opposite, if you have the best lure possible and you're in a bad spot, like just at the dead zone, there's nothing that can, can, uh, can help save a, a bad trip if you're just in dead zones all day. So that's by far the number one thing. And we suffered for many years on, on focusing on the lures. I have a whole tackle, a uh, whole second bedroom with all sorts of tackle because I thought that my problem was tackle and it was, it was actually in between the years. Even, even remember we used to fish live shrimp a lot, right. Or under a little cork. And there'd be times we thought the shrimp was a problem. Oh man, we should have got bigger ones. Oh man. All the hell was these small ones, man. They ruined our day. We were fishing a dead zone. Like, like thinking like back, like, Oh my gosh, we were so naive. Uh, what do you think, Pat? Yeah. Do you go through this same? Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's absolutely true. Uh, do you remember probably, I don't know, it was four or five years ago, y'all had uh, the quiz, the, the which type of fisherman are you, the reason why you're not, and you had names for them. Well, I specifically remember uh, what my problem was, and it hit home. I was dead fish, dead spot Dan. So I was the guy that would go out there and, and, and the spot looked great because, you know, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm transitioning from bass to, to saltwater. And that's kind of what we did. You just drive around and you say, okay, the spot looks good. You fish it for a while. Well, I was the guy that would go out there and fish that dead spot for all morning, literally just cast all day and not realize that, Hey, there's no fish here because, you know, it's not the trends. It's not the right place to be. You know, it's, you know, I'm, I'm fishing, you know, windblown shorelines on the winter or wind protected shorelines. So I'm just not doing the right things. And, 
And uh, no matter how hard you try, and no matter how much you're pre-planning, you know, how well you did your pre-planning, if you get out on the water and you're not seeing, you know, signs of life and it's a dead spot, move, get out of there. Uh, but that was a big problem for me. And I didn't even realize it until, you know, you started putting those puzzle pieces together and like, you know, in, in saltwater inshore fishing, most of the time, you're going to see some sort of activity before you start catching fish. Yep. I love it. Which ties in with number two. And the number two don't is staying in the same spot for way too long. We did that. You know, we put the anchor down, power poles, whatever you got and sit there for hours and now, I mean, if, if you get on our boat and fish with us, we'd be moving. Like we're not staying in any spot more than 10, 15 minutes max, unless there is a nice bite going on or like 120% lots of signs of life. Well, what do you, what do you say to that guys? How, how long are you staying in an actual spot? Yeah. I, you know, ever since I started uh, moving along uh, quicker than I used to, my catch rate has gone up. So I'm putting more fish in the boat. I'm, I'm catching more slams. I'm, I'm having way more success on the water. Well, I used to have this thing in the back of my, my mind where I would get stuck. Okay. I put all this effort into the pre-plan and I, I would just stick to that pre-plan too hard. And then when I'd get on the water, I'm not really paying attention to what, you know, nature's telling me, what the fish are telling me. And uh, it would just, you know, just be too stubborn and I'll just keep fishing the same area when I should have, you know, gave it 10, 15 minutes, then moved on. And uh, ever since I started uh, practicing that, uh, you know, my catch rate has definitely gone up. So yeah, 10, 15 minutes max, unless like you said, Joe, uh, you're just seeing tons of signs of life, or you have an area that's so dialed in that you know that this tide swing or this tide level, uh, the, the fish are going to get turned on. Yeah, it's, it's not worth uh, wasting your time. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a big one, too. And, and it's just, again, it's rare that somebody, no matter how experienced, can look at a map and, and okay, I know they're going to be right here. Right? We all need to have at least three to five spots for any given time because fish move. A dolphin could have gone in the area and just wrecked it and, and have everything spooked. And it's not worth waiting 30 minutes on those fish to, to, to actually start feeling comfortable again. Just go to the next spot. I remember for many years, we'd get out there and we'd spend an hour catching bait. And then we go to our number one spot, right? We only had like one spot or maybe two and there'd already be a boat there ahead of us. And it was like, we just thought they were the worst people on earth, like just mad at them, you know, because they got to our spot, like our spot. And in reality, now I could care less because it, it's all about the type of spot and matching the type of spot to the conditions. Then we do it properly. There's going to be 50 or more types of spots that are likely going to hold fish. So if somebody's in one of the spots, just go to the next one, Right. In most cases, there's really good spots within a you know half mile or sometimes even closer that you can just go to. And if somebody's in your spot, no problem, go to the next one. It's uh, yeah. it's much less stressful when you're armed with the, the knowledge on on just looking for the type of spot instead of like the GPS spot. Like the uh, for for years we were we were really beholden to our, our like half dozen spots. And that was a just, huge problem. You guys are just like looking at the, at the notes. Uh, Cause you're literally setting this up perfectly because the next mistake or the big don't is just fishing the same spots over and over and over again. And I mean, we can say that to we're blue in the face and yet so many people may, including us sometimes, right. It is, it is easy to be in an area that you had an epic day and want to go back to that spot. That's natural. And you should do that. Like if, if the trends are telling you that there's going to be fish there again, then by all means do it. Don't, don't just ignore a spot that you caught fish. But if you just rely on those one or two or three spots, just because you caught fish there and you never tied in the trends with it and like actually thought about it, well, man, why, why were the fish underneath this dock or up on this oyster bar, this certain tide and this moon phase, then, then you need to go out and explore a little bit more. And that's a big part of our insider club, right? That's why we're, we're, we're not afraid to show our spots, if you will. And, and we're not afraid to be very giving and generous with all the things that we're learning because we're all out there fishing new areas every week because that's, that's, that's how you get better, right? Uh, that's how you learn. The only way you get a good spot is, is to, you had to go find it at some point or someone had to show it, show it to you. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it kills me how many people and, and how many guests we've had in the past that have said, man, that's my number one regret is just fishing the same handful of spots over and over again. I was like missing out on so much. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've got a, an example of the, that that happened to me this week. I saw it uh, on this flat that I uh, that had a, the day that I had uh, Friday. I had a really, really good redfish day. I, mean, they were, I caught a lot of fish that day. But Wednesday, when I went by that same flat, 
Uh, it was prefrontal, uh, so it was, you know, we had a front coming in, a little wind. Uh, there was a boat that was fishing this deeper cut, you know, and that was the trends, you know, the deeper cuts were where the fish was at, and they were doing pretty well as I was going by. Well, Friday morning, I saw that same exact boat fishing that same exact spot. Trends had completely changed because now we're on a warming trend and not a cooling trend. I caught 20 redfish within the side of that boat, and I never saw them catch a fish. Wow. They were just fishing because they probably had a good day in that deeper water, you know, uh, prefrontal, but they went back to that same exact spot, totally different uh, uh, weather trend, and uh, got scum from what I could tell. Yeah, so yeah, and you don't want to keep. And on you were in your things. kayak. I was in my kayak. Yeah. Wow, uh, could it be? Could it be the next <laughs> don't is is ties in with this, and it's falsely believing. This is a big one here, and this is probably going to create some controversy. But this is a really big one, and it's falsely believing that those that have a boat always have an advantage, right? And it's natural progression. You start with a pair of waders and, and maybe you're hitting piers or, you know, maybe you're hitting the beaches or little canals and you're like, man, it'd be so cool if I could go out there and, and really explore. And, and it is cool to explore. And then maybe you get a kayak or a paddle board. And then you're like, oh man, I really, I really want to get a boat and have something with an engine. And, and the, a sweet irony we talked about the other day, Luke, is, right is here we were we were fisting super shallow and we're like here we are like literally 10 15 feet from shore in a in our boat and the guys and gals who are fishing from shore are sitting there wishing they could cast past <laughs> us right and and want to be out as far out as possible and and you had a perfect example here this week pat where you're catching fish of a kayak wyatt who owns a kayak and a boat he's like man i'd like i catch more fish wave fishing yeah. and sometimes mm -hmm. he uses the boat to get to those spots but many times he's just out there in his in his waders stealthily mm -hmm. hunting uh, like an old school hunter and uh and absolutely destroying it so what are your guys thoughts on on that on yeah, the, i mean the, wait yeah wait fishing you can catch the biggest fish i mean there it's and it's just because it's quieter right that this especially if you're in a big boat you know the fish can feel the, the the presence of a boat that's a lot of, of of volume that's being displaced and especially if there's waves they can hear the whole slap um same for kayaks as well so so waders have a huge advantage if they can get to the fish so that's where if you're wade fishing it's more important to be really good at reading maps and, and knowing you know why fish move and, and how they move yeah. i should say it and where they move based on based on the conditions because if you can if you can you know plan it right where based on the conditions, you look at the current flow, look at the weather, and you can get yourself into a good spot, you're going to catch more fish than the people on the kayaks, the people on the boats. And the only advantage of, of boats is just, is just being able to, to travel further faster. Um, so you have a little bit more leeway in case your plan isn't really good. But, but as far as getting to the good spot, if you're there, wade fishermen have a huge advantage. Yep. My, uh, my biggest snook uh, came uh, wade fishing. Yeah, the, you're just, it is more stealthy. And, you know, another advantage, and I'm not saying uh, that wade fishing is the ultimate, you know, because there is, you know, one thing that a boat does that a kayak can't do is it opens up more opportunities. So when you're kayak fishing, you know, you'll, you'll pick your, um, your four or five spots that you want to, that you want to hit. But if those four or five spots don't uh, pan out, uh, you know, you're talking about possibly loading your kayak back up in your truck and going somewhere else, more than likely, you're probably going to go home. But if you're at a boat, you can go much further. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, an advantage that waiting does have, uh, you know, in Texas, you know, I, I've realized this now, the wind blows constantly here. It's 20 miles an hour. And what's the hardest part when the wind blows? It's boat positioning and control. Well, when you're waiting, you don't have that problem. You can just turn and, you know, your, your feet are planted. You stake your, uh, your boat out and you go to walk. And, you know, each, each one has its advantage. But, you know, it is funny, like you said, Joe, it seems like a lot of people that, you know, they're, they're envious of the boat owners if they're shore fishing. And then the boat owners are envious of the kayak guys because they can go shallower. You know, there, there's all kinds of stuff, but uh, use what you got to your advantage and just get good at what, you know, what you have. Yeah. The cool thing about the cool thing about inshore saltwater, especially compared to bass fishing, where inshore saltwater, a lot of the biggest fish push up into the shallowest water to feed. And so that's why it's, it's a very common occurrence to see trophy snook, trophy redfish trophy trout held by people fishing from shore and it's it's not quite like that for bag i grew up bass fishing where a lot of times the the bigger bass are are uh, aren't, aren't really available by foot so saltwater really levels the playing field um for for anybody whether you have a boat kayak or or nothing on at all just a pair of wading uh, wading boots uh, everybody has access to really good fish
It's good. All right. Next, don't. It's all about being a specialist. Don't be a generalist. Be a specialist. It's what we should be telling our kids these days, the way our society is going, right? I mean, if you become an expert, if you will, at any kind of field, I mean, same with doctors, right? The people who have like laser specialty are, are getting paid more than someone who's just a general practitioner or the, uh, the, the general pediatrician. Someone who only does cancer for pediatrics makes more than, than, you know, a doctor that's just general pediatrics. And we've seen the same with fishing. And if you watch the pros, I'm talking about both saltwater and freshwater, the guys and gals who are up there on the podiums, and they usually have one or two lures that they're using to like win a tournament. And, and in many times it's one, they're like, I caught all five of these trophy winning bass or redfish or whatever on this one or two lures, they become an absolute specialist. Pat, you did it with topwater lures, which was absolutely crazy. Pat only fished topwater lures for a whole year because he, and he wasn't the best at it when he started at the end, he was, he's like, I want to master this thing and become great with it. So what do you guys have in terms of stories and lessons learned on becoming a specialist and not a generalist with thousand different types of lures? Well, you know, um, one thing that really uh, helped me out was when I was bass fishing, one of my favorite lures to use was a, a Zoom Jerk Chat. Uh, and that was like my go-to. I love fishing uh, lily pads and you'd cast it up in the pads, reel it up to a hole and just kill it, let it sink down. And that was just a uh, you know, in the right conditions, I would say that was a, a deadly uh, setup. Well, guess what? It's the same thing when I moved over to uh, saltwater fishing, you know, the jerk chat. So I was really, really comfortable with using it. Of course, I was fishing those dead spots I was talking about, but but I was comfortable with using that lure. And I would say probably the first couple of years I, uh, I fished uh, inshore saltwater, I only fished that jerk chat. And right now, I, you know, I can tell you, like, I, I have uh, I've traveled from Florida. I fish in Louisiana. I fished in Corpus Christi, and now I'm down here in the uh, southern end of uh, Texas, and I've caught all my fish on one lure, the gold digger, and I've caught fish in every state. Gold so, digger paddletail? You know, yeah, the gold the digger paddletail. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's that's what I've been using. It's uh, It's been working great. Uh, you know, I caught uh, some really nice big black drums, some redfish, some really nice trout. And, and you know, like, like I said, it doesn't take a whole tackle box of lures. You just get really good with a handful of lures and know which situation, how to rig them, then that's all you really need. Yeah, and, and, the, and the cool thing about the, the benefit of just specializing is that when you're specialized and, and you're just comfortable with rigging, Right. So you're not second guessing yourself and so that you can put your focus on what we already covered is the number one thing. And that's finding fish. You can you can go ask, uh, you know, 10 different fishing guides what their favorite lure is, and you'll probably get 10 different answers. That's just a testament that the, the lure is not the number one. Right. And, and just, just pick one. Mine, mine was a jerk shot, just like you, Pat. Uh, but in hindsight, I wish I would have selected just a smaller paddle tail. Um, because now this is what I use more often than not. And it's just easier. It's, it's, it takes a little bit less effort to, to retrieve. You can just do a straight retrieve. The tail does the work, but like get a, like a small paddle tail, just get some lure and just, just force yourself to use it. And what you'll find is that you're going to get better and better and better. Uh, and you're going to be, you're going to be covering more ground because you're not going to waste time or effort changing out lures. And, uh, and it's just the fish catching is going to go up. Yep, love it. All right. Next don't got a friend who's a golf pro and he said in most instances it's easier to take someone who's never golfed before in their life to become consistent not 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 a not a pro but to become consistent than it is to take someone who's been golfing for 20 years and sucks at it and it's because they've been practicing the wrong thing for so long and he's got to unteach or untrain all these bad habits and all these bad little things Luke, this is, this is for you because you talk about it all the time is the big don't here is don't practice the wrong stuff. Yeah, we hear it all the time. Oh, man, I would if, if only I could fish more. We, we, we have a fishing club in case you're not familiar with Salt Strong. We're, we're an online fishing club. It's, oh, you know, I would join. I just don't have enough time to, to do it. I need, to, I need to spend more time in the water before I can even, even bother getting good. And that's, like, that's the worst thing you can do. Because as Joe said, if if you don't have the proper mechanics, when you go out on the water, you're going to be practicing bad things and you're going to be ingraining the bad habits into your, into your plan, into your, your time on the water. And that's, yes, you might get a little bit better, but you're going to be capped. And it's just really important is, is just a first step 
is to go out there and like Joe said, like get the training, hire the golf pro. All right. If you want to get good at golf, hire the golf pro, learn the good mechanics and then go practice them. And the same thing holds true to fishing, right? Learn the mechanics. We have the insider fishing club. And what comes with that is the, the three core courses that lays the foundation, which is the mechanics, the finding spots, mastery, the approach and positioning and the fishing one of the fishing one one like that is the, the proper mechanics learn that and then go out and practice those. And we've seen a ton of people go from total newbies had no idea what they're doing to consistently catching slams. It's really simple as that. Just don't practice bad mechanics is, is the, the core lesson. Yeah. I mean, those three courses, it's like spending three hours with, with a fishing pro instead of a golf pro. I mean, it, it and you can do it on your own time. You from your phone, it is so helpful and it's proven to work with thousands and thousands of people who have, uh, who have been, been through it. And we even have full-time guides who go through those, those first three courses. And they're like, wow, like there's some really, really amazing stuff in here. Stuff that I I've forgotten or have, 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 have never even thought about in the, in the past. So super, super helpful uh, on that. Um, tying in with this, this is the next don't is not pre-trip planning or forgetting to pre-trip plan. You want to pre-trip plan. Let me say it a different way. And we did a whole podcast on this just, a, a, what a, I guess, a week or so ago. And, and that was critical. Some of my absolute worst trips are when I just try to wing it and just go out there and you kind of think they're going to be here. Talk about what you guys do. Pat, like, what are you doing there? You're in a brand new state. What are you doing for, for pre-trip planning? So basically what I'm doing is I'm following the trend in the area. So uh, what, what I've been running into is there's been a, a big difference in the weather uh, between, say, Louisiana and South Texas. So South Texas, this is closer to a spring pattern. So I'm going into more transitional zones. So I know in the springtime, they're, gonna, they're not going to go super, super deep, and they're not going to stay up shallow. They'll move up shallow whenever the sun comes out. So I'm starting out in the morning with uh, intermittent potholes, and then I'll work my way shallower. Now, in Louisiana, when I was there, the weather was Cold. It was cold. It was winter patterns. So I was using uh, winter trends. So I would go on the uh, computer. Uh, first thing I'm going to check for being in a kayak is winds. Then I'll check my tides. And then I'm going to uh, check the, um, the weather, whether it's going to be sunny or cloudy. And that's going to dictate uh, where I'm going to start fishing. And then the most important thing after that is once you get your pre-planning, you also got to do your on the water observations too. But, but yeah, I would never, ever, ever go out in an area without doing a lot of map studies, especially a new area. Now back home, if I knew the area, uh, then I'm looking at closer weather patterns, but you know, fishing in an area that I've never been to before, I'm doing a lot of uh, satellite image searches and uh, just following whatever the trends are at the, uh, at the moment for the weather and then uh, going off that. Yeah, it's super important. And what I found, uh, part, one of my goals is just to fish every, like every mile of Florida. And so I've just been chipping away at it. And, and so every week I'll go out to a new area that I've never been to before. And, and then I'll also fish in my home waters too, uh, when I have time, because it's just easier and quicker. But what I found is that my consistency is actually better when I go to areas I've never been before, because I don't have my mind taking me back to my old promised land spots, right? Where I've had a an epic day and I just, oh man, like I know this, I've caught a hundred fish down this bar. I need to go there. But if that, if that bar isn't matching the type of spot that I know I should be going to based on the trends and based on what we, you know, what we teach in the, in the, in the club uh, and every week. Um, it, conversely, if I go to a new area, I don't have that, that hurdle, right? I just I now just totally focus on the type of spot based on conditions, based on the wind, based on the season, based on the feeding trends, like Pat mentioned, and, uh, and it is shocking how effective it is. Something I never thought I'd be able to do is consistently catch slams in foreign territory. And it's surprisingly easy as long as you have the playbook. And it's surprisingly easy to go off, off base or to not plan at all when you're going back to the home waters. So even when I'm fishing home areas, what, what I do and I, what, what I recommend everybody do is do a plan, first of all, but also pick a spot that you've never been to before. Right. Even even if you're fishing areas, you fish all the time. There might be a little cove you've never tried or a little point or pocket that you haven't been been before. Just do it. And, and what you'll find is that a lot of those those kind of uh, skipped over spots, there could be some some good, good honey holes. And it should be a good it's always a good lesson learning just to go explore some. Good stuff. All right. Next don't. It's going too big on the reel, the line, et cetera. 
I, I would say that was something that we certainly did. I continue to see it or a, a new angler will come in and maybe sometimes in our store before we can like coach them and they'll buy a 4,000 or even a five or 6,000 series reel because they've never caught a big fish before in, in the saltwater. Maybe they just caught bass and all of a sudden they, they see these 40 inch redfish. And that is like, man, that's a monster fish. And you say, well, no way in the world can I not catch that without a monster reel? Right. And the truth is all you need for even fish like that in many cases is a, I mean, a 2,500 or 3000. And, and Peter Deeks talks about this a lot. He's like, focus on getting the strike first, right. Getting the fish on. And then you figure out how to reel the sucker in. You will be shocked at how much and how big of a fish a 3000 series reel, or even a 2,500 will do with 10 pound braid. It, it is amazing. The power there. So talk about that guys. We've all done it. We've got way too much and you see it all the time. And it's usually the people who are struggling that they got, they got a 4,000 series reel with 30 pound braid on there and they're ready to catch a redfish. In reality, they could probably be catching a glide grouper with that. Uh, what do you, what do you guys say? It's like you actually went back in time and saw where I started inshore fishing. That's exactly what I did. It was a 4,000 reel, 30 pound braid with yes. a six foot medium heavy rod. I could cast about 20 yards and no wonder I wasn't catching fish. So on top of being in the dead spot, you know, I couldn't get 60 feet from the boat. So yeah, it was just, it was just, everything was wrong, everything. And it took a while to realize that exactly what you're saying, that you don't need that 4,000 reel. Matter of fact, uh, you know, I was fishing with Wyatt uh, last week up in Corpus, and uh, I was, you know, we were catching some big uh, uh, black drum. It was a really nice black drum. I had a 2,500 uh, reel, a 10 pound braid, and 12 pound leader. That, that you don't need uh, all this massive stuff. I think what happens is people get intimidated with with saltwater fish, and they see a tr that gator trout that's got those teeth, and they're thinking, "Well, oh, I need that big steel leader. I need that 60 pound mono or whatever it is." No, you, you don't need all that stuff. It, it's literally way simpler than uh, than what you think. To scale it way down. Yeah, I did a casting contest, and uh, and it was with 10 pound braid to 20 pound braid because I when I, I started with mono and I was late to switch away from mono to braid, and that alone was a game changer as far as casting performance and feel of strikes. It's a huge benefit for those of us using spinning tackle, but but even going, I, I went to a 20 pound uh, braid because it's so thin. I was looking at the diameter. A 20 pound braid is way thinner than a 10 pound mono, so I was like, oh sweet, I can get thinner line and it's stronger. But a 10 pound braid to a 20 pound braid, all else being equal on doing a casting contest, the 10 pound braid was casting about 20% further. And doing the math, it would end up being an entire football field of extra distance simple, every 15 casts simply from changing lines. And there's not much else you can do to guarantee more fish catching than to be able to cover an extra football field of distance every 15 casts. That not only is it more territory, but it's all the ideal strike zone. It's all the fish that are furthest away from you that are the most likely to eat, especially the big ones. And to be able to just to get your lure to them or your bait, right? For you using line bait, um, just to be able to reach those fish that are less likely to know that you're there is a game changer. And so a lot of the people that I see struggling, when I start, they, they're asking, hey, like what's wrong to start sharks as far as the dissection? My number one question is what equipment are you using? And almost always the answer is a 20 or 30, sometimes even 60 pound braid mm. that they're using. And that is the best way to, to struggle. It is, it's just a handicap. It's just putting yourself uh, against the hurdle. And, and the, even these lines, if you, if you know good knots, even the 10 pound braid, it, the breaking point is usually going to be around 20 pounds. As long as you tie a good knot, like the FG knot is an amazing knot. Um, I've actually recently gone out a five pound braid and, uh, and that I've been catching more slot snook after making that change, because I can cast further, the line is thinner, so they have less like uh, less ability to feel it. And, uh, and I've seen a, an uptick in my fish catching going down to that five pound line, which again, which I never would have considered years ago. I would thought that I'd be a, there'd be no way I'd get a slot snook on five pound braid, but it's strong. It's way stronger than, than listed. And again, tie good knots. Um, and and it's, it's, it's surprising. Obviously don't use that in the, like in inlets with like high current and really big fish, but up in the bays, I mean, you can, you really don't need that much power. That's good. All right. Next one, start off with a little story. Went fishing with a, a newer angler and 
sitting there at the at the boat already at the ramp and this person's coming down with their big old tackle bag monster tackle bag and you could hear them coming from like a mile away kind of like if you could hear someone who's got a bunch of change in their pocket or like you know like a janitor type of keychain with like 50 different keys and as they get closer like what is that noise and turns out it's coming from the tackle bag like what what do you have in there well those are my swivels so the big don't hear is too much terminal tackle. We did it. I used to have a whole swivel case, right? And we had all this different terminal tackle. Talk about that, guys, because that's another one that we've all done it. We all think we need all this extra stuff. And in general, there are times when you do need it. So we're not completely poo-pooing on on terminal tackle. But I I believe the more you can eliminate, the more strikes you will get. Uh, Just keeping it simple. What, What do you guys think? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. It's um, when I go out on my uh, my kayak, I literally have a 19 quart uh, angle cooler that is my dry box. I, don't, I you know I don't keep fish, but if it does not fit in that 19 quart cooler, it does not go on my kayak. And the the more you you pare things down, the better off you're going to be because what's going to happen is like Luke had mentioned and earlier, you get to know situationally what you need to use. The most important thing isn't necessarily, you know, the lure is important, but it's the way you rig it is just as important, if not more important. If you're not, you know, using the right size jig head to get down to the bottom, or if you're not, uh, you know, using a weedless presentation when, you know, you need to, uh, you know, you're, you're going to be at a disadvantage. So, you know, literally the, the most important tackle box you have is going to be your hooks and jig, yeah, jig heads. It's, that's the one you need. And it doesn't take up that much uh, room. I'll, I'll carry, this is basically what I carry on the kayak with me. I got some Alabama leprechauns. I got the Slam Shady 2.0s. I'll bring some Fred, some gold diggers and power prawns. And that pretty much, you know, and some rigging hooks will cover just about any scenario uh, that I'll run across, you know, as long as I got the right size jig hooks. But yeah, don't, it, it, just don't get caught up in it has to be you know a red lure with gold flakes and white tail with you know i don't think that's you know that's so far down the list of importance you know just use the bait that you're confident with confident with and make sure you're getting it in the fish's face yeah and and just less is more too like as far as the swivels go you don't need that extra even even the clips right oh man like i need to be able to change my lures more quickly let me use the speed clips um, it's just, it's more weight on the lure. It's one more thing that, that the bigger, smarter fish can see. And, and in reality, you don't need to be changing lures. We've already went to that. So you need to be, if you're not catching fish, it's most often due to just not fish being in that particular area. So it's time to move, take that same lure and go to a different spot. And, and I did, uh, to, as far as swivels go, I did an experiment, which really surprised me. And, and it, it, it led me, uh, led me to believe that if you're using braid, swivels really don't do anything because braid is just so nimble that I, I did a test that in I, there's a there's a uh, post you can google it um but i was twisting the swivel like a mono on one side and braid on the other and it took seven turns per inch for the swivel to finally start letting some of the the unravels out to, to stop letting the the ravels begin at least if you have seven that's seven turns seven twists per inch that's a lot of twists. So you're going to be getting wind knots before you get to that many twists. So the swivels really don't do that much good. Um, so less is more. Knots are better without swivels, which is another big surprise. When I was doing knot contest, the, the FG knot from a braid to a leader is stronger than any knot that I found that connects to a swivel. So the, the lines actually kind of cushion themselves. The, the reason why is because lines kind of cushion themselves instead of t- a, a line, tying a line to, to a hard surface. Um, tied line to line they cushion themselves and they actually prevent each other from breaking so there's really no benefit if you're using light braid there's not a benefit to using swivels Um, even if you're using a spoon i I now don't do swivels at all good all right next one next don't one thing more important than just focusing on spots ironically it happens to start with the next letter in the alphabet after s for spots so T, what can you guys, what do you think it is? It's trends. Trends. Trends it is. Let's talk about trends. It's the big focus of our insider club. It's what, we, you know, we've now boiled it down to just 10 minutes every Friday. So, you know, we realized pretty quickly. Still there? Whoa, I missed. What happened there? Oh, I don't know. Just, oh, it's my. Uh, here you oh, know. Someone uh, called and all of a sudden my whole screen just went blank. 
Um, <laughs> apologize, guys, for that. We're that's we're live. We can't mess up. Um, but no, we we realized pretty quickly that you know people are busy, right? And and even though we have all this great stuff, and you could spend literally hours a day going through it all, we it's just like a library. A lot of people just want it short and sweet. 10 minutes, right? So, cause it's tough to say in one minute, right? So we try to pull everything down to 10 minutes. So 10 minutes every Friday morning is when we come up with this smart fishing game plan. And it's like having a, a, a fishing guide on speed dial. Uh, it, it's like having a fishing guide in your back pocket where you could get everything you need to know about where the fish are holding. And obviously no one's going to just give you a GPS spot and say fish right here, just based on all the stuff we told you fish do move. You need to have a plan, but at least it's going to give you a massive head start and a massive advantage over all your friends and over the fish to be able to go out there and consistently find them. And so it's all based on trends and that part. It's so, so important, right? Cause you I mean, th these fish, they, they react to the weather, right? Fish are very reactive. Uh, I mean, same as humans, right? You know, we're, we're, we react to the weather. That's why we always like to talk about the weather. Fish do the same thing. And if you can start understanding that based on trends, you can start predicting at least the types of areas they will be in. So that is the massive focus of our Insider Club. If you members who are listening, you know this. If you're not a member, what the heck are you waiting on? So talk about that. What, what were your aha moments when it came to, to trends and, and how critical that is. I got it. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say, I mean, for me, it was really when I'm an analytical person. And for many years, I was actually printing out the tide graphs on like every trip I went on. And I was putting marks on it with, with like letters signifying what species I was catching so that I could see when I, exactly when I was catching them. Obviously, they were, they were by day. And I was organizing them by day and by year and then when I go out the next year I'd pull out the prior year stuff and and try to figure out where I was and everything and what I realized is that the year over year analysis is really is not very helpful it's I mean it sort of is but what the biggest change was the biggest benefit is when I started just networking with other fishermen and getting real-time reports like what happened the last seven days is way more valuable than what happened during the same time of the year the past seven years right like year over year analysis is kind of helpful but what's game changing is human intelligence on what's happening now right like what has just recently happened because when i started a tournament series when i started getting more serious about fishing i was decent and i was going out and catching you know, at least consistently catching at least one good fish a trip so i mean my buddy now let's go let's go try out but we were going against guides right there are full-time fishing guides in there they're smoking us because they're on the water every day and they're networking with each other. It's rare that there's a guide that isn't networking with other guides because they're, they're smart, right? It's the, except for Bob, the lone wolf. Except for, <laughs> except for old Bob. <laughs> but um, but it's, it's, they're doing it for a reason because it is the most powerful thing you can do. And, and, and so eventually we got tired of getting beat by the guides. So there was four, four teams, all amateurs, all have normal jobs, weekend warriors. And a lot of us couldn't pre-fish the tournament. So we would just, just tell each other, hey, like, here's where we were. We were using these lures. The fish were holding this type of area this day. And, and we look at the wind and and then we go and, and like eventually at least one of the four teams, in some cases, all of us were on the leaderboard making money. And whereas before when we were trying to do it ourselves, we, we weren't. We were getting smoked by the by the actual guide. So the, the real time human intelligence by far is the number one thing as far as trends. Don't worry about year over year nearly as much Good. yeah absolutely it's it's not uh you can sit there i'm sure you did this yourself luke when you went back there and looked at that uh that that data okay on uh september 26th you know the fish were hitting on this lure in this spot but you know it might have been an early winter so you know that's a different uh that's a different trend you know you you, you see it you know the the mullet run on the east coast you know we get that uh, that fall mullet run it doesn't happen on you know november 1st every year sometimes it you know it scatters through you know you know it really doesn't matter as far as a calendar date it literally is trends and you could you know you could be in december fishing fall trends because we haven't had a winter yet you know it, it's it's literally that that what happened the week before what's the weather doing and uh what how how is everybody else catching fish what kind of spots uh are they catching fish in and you can emulate that just about everywhere 
Yeah, because the reality, and you nailed it too, the reality is fish are not smart. They're just reacting to the to the changing weather. And year over year, the weather is changing. It's very rare that the fronts happen the same time frame. And so it's actually kind of silly to think that the year over year stuff is going to work because the, the weather patterns just change so much. So it's it's really about, okay, like what happened the last cold front or, or what happened yesterday or the day before? That is way, way more important than than the year over year stuff. And I that would have saved me a ton of time and paper and organizational uh, brain power to not have been printing out all those tie charts and, and spending time trying to figure it out the old fashioned way. Just, just network with friends, really network with other fishermen is, is the, the biggest thing. Yeah. The, net, the network part it's overlooked and it's huge. And that's how you dial in the trends. Um, this is good. Um, so really there's one of two things to do next. If you've mastered all 10 of these that we just talked about, meaning you're truly catching more fish than you know what to do with. You always catch inshore slams. I know it's, it's almost boring. <laughs> then call us. We'd love to talk with you because we're looking for new fishing coaches always. Uh, so if you fit in that category where you're catching more fish and you've absolutely maximized every hour of every day of every time you fish, then definitely call us. If you haven't, which is the majority of people, then come join us in the insider club, right? If, if, if you don't have 100% confidence in your spots, right? Based on trends, if you don't have confidence to know exactly where you should be going every time you hit the water, even if you only fish once or twice a year, or if it's once a week or once a month, doesn't matter. doesn't matter if you're in wading boots or a kayak or a paddleboard or a boat or a skiff, anything in between. If you want to just get better, one of the other big don'ts is not investing in yourself, right? You want to get good at anything. If I've got three young kids right now who want to get good at certain sports, we invest in a coach, right? We invest in 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 in, in a clubs, right? I mean, my daughter's in a little soccer club, and they're and she's got her own little network, and they're doing little drills and stuff. It's the same stuff we do in the Insider Club. That's why we built it, and we're constantly trying to get better. Even though this podcast in particular was was for beginners, and that was part of the title, it's for everyone. I mean, as I mentioned, we have full time guides who are joining the club. Uh, I'd say weekend warriors make up the majority of it. People who are, who, who have lives and are busy and have other jobs outside of the fishing world and, and, uh, and, and just want to maximize their time. But we get a lot of beginners and then we get people on the other end of the spectrum, which are our guides. So if you just want to up your game and be around like-minded people who are helpful and are, and are courteous and positive and sharing, then you will be blown away with how helpful our private community is. And, and there's really three pieces to it. We touched on it, that network, which is the community part, and then all the how-to and the, and the trends, right? That's all in the instructional part of it. And then we have discounts because we know it. Let's see, we're fishermen, we're anglers. We like to buy stuff. And, and, and it is nice to have nice tackle. It is nice to have, uh, you know, things that we know are going to work and are going to last in salt water. And so we've kind of handpicked what we believe is the best tackle out there for our members, the same stuff we're buying with our own harder money. And we give you great discounts on it because we have now almost 28,000 people in our club. And so we're able with, you know, the amount of members we have to go out there and get some really good pricing for you. And you save 20, sometimes 30% off everything in our store. And so we made it a complete no brainer and, and we have a now a, a, a whole year and, and, uh, in terms of a guarantee and not only just money back guarantee, but we did something crazy last year. We don't talk about it enough. It's a 200% money back guarantee. So that means if you stick with it a year, right, you have to stick with the whole year. And if you feel like it was a waste of your time, like we wasted your time somehow and you truly didn't get better and, and save time and money, not only we give you your money back, we'll double it. And it, it's 97 bucks for the whole year, which if you boil that down per day comes to 27 cents per day. Pat, you can't even buy a cup of coffee for 27 cents, can you? No, not anymore. It's in no. uh, 1950. So even the home, even the homebrew stuff is more than 25 cents these days. I so think a K-cup is 50 cents. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's an absolute no-brainer. That's why we've you know had 27, 28,000 people now have joined and it's growing every single day. And we love for you to join us. And uh, as I said, you, we've taken all the risks off of you and put it on us to make sure that you were happy, you're thrilled, and you're seeing tons of value. It's how we wish every company treated us, just with an open door policy. If you're not loving it, then make adios, give your money back. Part ways as friends give you a hug on the way out. So hope you join us at saltstrong.com. 
you'll be at some point here, depending on how fast you go through the stuff and how engaged you are, you can become a master at all 10 of these things that we, uh, we talked about. We've all been through these, which is why it was easy for us to talk about because we've all done them. Uh, it, it's what everyone does and everyone's at different phases and on a different journey in their, uh, their fishing game. And uh, we'd love to have you regardless of where you are. So that's at saltstrong.com. For you current members, thank you guys so much. We'll see you in the community. Got some cool prizes and giveaways we're doing right now and uh, in there and some new tackle we'll be talking about here very soon for our members. So Luke and Pat, thank you guys. Thank good you. times. This is good. Yeah, great. This was good. All right, guys, we'll see you on the next podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and uh, to leave us a review that helps out big time on both the podcast and on youtube appreciate you guys big time talk to you on the next episode peace we out whoop, whoop.